And if you've been joining us, it's been a series entitled Mythbusters. And it's, it's essentially been a series where we have looked at a variety of, of views, just a variety of positions that, that, that people hold on to with regards to their understanding of faith and in regards to their understanding of Jesus, the regards to their understanding with, uh, about the church. And, and we just wanted to kind of been looking into, well, well, are these views that we need to hold on to? Or, or, or rather, should we be pointed in a, a different uh, direction? And so next Sunday, we're going to be um, starting a new series as we enter into Advent. And it's a series uh, rather fitting um, with regards to what Brian has, has just shared with us. But all I want for Christmas is dot, 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 right? So um, I know you hear Christmas songs going right now, and there's a number of different Christmas songs that have all I want for Christmas. So um, we're going to be looking at that. And just, just again, look at this, this incredible time of year um, and to see what is it that, that Jesus desires for all of us as well. Uh, but this morning, we're going to kind of end on this series of, of different views. And I know I haven't been able to touch on everyone's views or everyone's questions, which, which got me thinking that perhaps this will be like a, a series down the road that we can come back to, kind of a, a part two or a sequel. Although even though sequels are never good the second time in movies, hopefully the series won't fall into that trap, right? So, um, but, but it's constantly a place where we want to be on a Sunday morning where we are exploring and questioning our views and understanding what is it that God desires for us and, 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 and what does it look like in a day-to-day -day journey to live all of life with Jesus? And so this morning, we're going to deal with a view, deal with a subject, an issue that that more recently a number of people have been asking me about, particularly because of the series I've been doing. I've had people come to me and say, well, when are you going to talk about this? And the this is the subject of heaven. People say, well, what is, what is heaven like? Who gets to go to heaven? And you realize that, that this is one of those topics that, 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 that we already come with a lot of ideas and understandings. And are they true? Are they false? Are they helpful? Should we guide our lives by them? And so the question I really want to kind of unpack a little bit more this morning is simply this. Everyone goes to heaven, right? And, and I phrase it that way because... The first part is this idea that, that perhaps this is what we want, this is what we desire, but is it really true? And so regardless of what you believe here this morning, regardless of, of where you're coming from, where I want to kind of challenge all of us is to always first and foremost begin to ask yourself the question, what is your source? What is the place in your life that truly gives you authority that allows you to believe and to hold on to the, the truths that guide your life? Because, because one of the traps, one of the dangers is that, is that we, we go to the place that just feels right and, and feels good. And, and sometimes we have to take a step back and to say, okay, well, why do I believe what I believe? And that's why to kind of, in some ways, to set up this, this, this message this morning, on November the 2nd, if you go back, we talked about the role of the Bible in our lives. Where, where does the Bible sit in terms of the word of, of bringing authority and speaking into our lives? And so, if you ever miss a Sunday, um, you know, we upload all of our messages to our webpage. You can always jump on and, and go back. And so, this is the place where we begin as to asking ourselves the question, why do I believe what it is I believe? And so to kind of unpack this a little bit, I think the first question we need to start looking at is, what is heaven like? You know, does the Bible tell us, does, does, does Jesus give us descriptions as to what heaven is like? Because I think there's some misguided views out there. I don't know if you've seen the commercial. You probably have. Um, you know those, those Philadelphia cream cheese commercials? I love cream cheese. They're a terrible theology, right? But their, their commercials are working because I'm talking about it on a Sunday morning. So kudos to the marketers. But if heaven is like, you know, sitting up on the clouds and having a bunch of manservants play the harp and serve you cream cheese, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to go there. 
right? And so you have to ask yourself the question, okay, is it, is it like that? A lot of the times what, what I hear people talking about is that, is that heaven is like this eternal, individual, pleasure factory. This idea that, okay, when I get to heaven, it's going to be like fill in the blank. Um, it's going to be like Las Vegas, or it's going to be like Club Med, or it's going to be like Disney World, or it's going to be the place of just great candy, and you know, Willy Wonka and his chocolate factory. Like Some people may have that as a vision of what heaven is like, of, of just, I am going to be able to indulge, and I'm going to be able to enjoy, and you know, he talks about paradise, so it must be my paradise, right? But again, if you stop yourself in your tracks for a moment and think, well, wait a second, what is this supporting? Is this actually the view of what God desires heaven to be like? Because if heaven is an eternal pleasure factory, then it's all about me. It's all about me getting what I want. And that sounds pretty counter to everything that Jesus ever talks about. Jesus is the one who speaks about being other-centered. He's the one who talks about laying down your life for the benefit of others, ultimately to serve God. And so there's a real danger. It actually promotes the, the narcissism in our society, the, the, the it's all about me and it's all about what I want, that we even actually transfer that into eternity. Because if you look at the Bible you begin to see over and over and over again God desiring to be in a relationship with his people. You see, actually, this, this idea of being able to do and to have absolutely everything that we want in eternity is actually the very problem that was set up in Genesis. Right? When, when, when Adam and Eve decided, you know what, God, I, I don't want to follow your ways. I want to do what is good for me and then suddenly sin entered the world, and suddenly there was this broken relationship. And so I think it's, it's somewhat misguided to think that, that heaven is, is simply going to be this, this paradise where, where I'm going to receive everything that I want. Because it seems too, too focused on ourselves. And so the question still remains, well, what is, what is heaven like? What is, what is heaven all about? And I think one of the great things about Scripture is that what we see in terms of what God desires for us in the midst of life before death, I believe, becomes an extension into eternity. And that ultimately, you've, you've heard me say this, and, and if I don't say this enough, I apologize, but ultimately what God desires is to be in a relationship with his people. Excuse me for a second. <coughs> a bit of a cold, so instead of hearing you me cough all the time. And so if what God desires in Scripture is for us to be in a relationship with Him, then to me it seems rather fitting Then that is what's going to become the reality beyond death is that there's going to be the reality of, of, of this relationship which is broken, which is, which is infested because of sin, which is not right because of the, the, the self-serving choices we make, is actually going to be perfected into all of eternity. And so, and so this relationship that God desires for us in this moment, on this day, is going to be an extension of the reality into all of eternity. And we see this. We're going to pull up a few slides. I actually, I should have mentioned this before, but there's inserts at all the doors covering a number of the scriptures I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to kind of move through them quickly. I'm not going to be able to touch on all of them, but if you want to grab an insert at the door as you leave, um, feel free. But we see some of the language that is used by Jesus describing eternity. The very first place we go is in Luke 23, and this is when Jesus is dying on the cross. And there's two thieves beside them. And one thief is joining in with the rest of the crowd, and he's heckling Jesus and, and going after Jesus. And there's this other thief on the other side who, who, who basically tells the other thief, shut it. Like, wh stop talking like that. You have no idea what you're saying. And then he turns to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, will, will you remember me? Will you remember me when you enter into your kingdom? 
And Jesus says these incredible words. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. But guess where our culture goes? We hear the word paradise, we're thinking, yeah, all right. The emphasis of that, of that, of that statement is, is Jesus saying, you will be with me. You can be assured of that relationship with me. Or we turn to John 14, one of these great passages where it's the night when Jesus is about to be arrested, uh, betrayed, and the following day he'll be crucified, and his disciples are just losing their minds. They're, they're confused, they don't understand, they're concerned, and Jesus comes alongside them and says, listen, you need to trust in me. I'm going ahead of you to prepare a place for you so that where I go, I will come back and bring you to be with me. Again, that emphasis of relationship. Or this time, Jesus speaking through John in in Revelation 21, where where we're told of of the new heaven and the new earth and, and, and how the bride is coming down beautifully dressed for the groom. Again, relationship. All the imagery is that of relationship. And then God speaks and says these words, And now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. You see, I think so often we we think of heaven as a place, as opposed to understanding that it's more about a person, and that is the person of God revealed through us in Jesus Christ. And so when, when someone says, well, what is, what is heaven like? It, it, it is living all of eternity in the very presence of God. And so a fair question to ask is, do you want that? Do you want to be in the presence of God for all of eternity? Because we speak of heaven, and then we think of hell. Hell. And there's lots of imagery that is using and there's, there's different positions in terms of what people hold with regards to hell. But my best understanding, if heaven is where God is, then hell is where God is not. And one of the challenges that we have to ask ourselves, one of the realities we have to deal with, is that if someone does not want God in their life in the midst of this time before death, Is God, once they die, going to turn to them and say, well, guess what? You rejected me for all of your life. Now you will have me for eternity. You see, God in his love gives us the ability to choose him or not. And God will honor that choice as hard as it may be to hear, it is the way in which God is at work. You see, oftentimes people say, well, I can't believe in a loving God. I can't believe in God because how would a loving God send people to hell? But I I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe that that's the reality. That as you look at the scriptures, as you begin to see, God's desire is that all people will be with him for all of eternity. We see this from Peter and from Paul, the two leaders of the early church. First we hear from Peter. When when people are basically heckling Peter in the early church and saying, "Where, where, where is this returning of your Messiah? Where is this God? Like, why hasn't he shown up yet, Peter? And Peter says these words. God is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And then Paul chimes in in speaking to Timothy. He says, God wants all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth. You see, the relationship that God desires is a relationship that is based on love. It is based on a choice of of will we choose to follow him. And, And I believe this, that the choices we make in life will begin the extension of all of eternity. You notice Jesus never never forces. Jesus got the big cup. All right, here we go. Jesus 
Jesus never forces, Jesus never coerces, Jesus never threatens people into heaven. And we see it in the, in, the, in the story we read this morning, the parable of the rich young ruler. And those are key words, right? Key words to understand. Um, I, I, we should have backed it up a little bit. I gave the wrong scripture right off the hop. But this guy comes to Jesus with the, with the words, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good question. Great question. All right, Jesus. Let's hear your answer. What are you going to say? Let's lay it out here. That's the question we want answered. And Jesus, first of all, is like, oh, well, you, you, you know the commandments. How, how, have you been, how have you been doing with that? And the guy's like, awesome, awesome. I've been following the commandments my whole life, ever since I've been a young boy. And Jesus is like, that is fantastic. And it's inserted, Jesus loved the man. He showed love to the man. He says, oh yeah, oh by the way, just, 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 one, just one more thing. One more thing. Um, I know you're a rich guy. I know you have lots of stuff. So sell all of that and then come and follow me. And we're told the guy is like just completely deflated because... He has a lot of stuff, and he walks away. Now, I've preached on this passage. I've, I've read this passage, and, I, and, and so often, again, the temptation is to go to this place of, well, is Jesus telling me that if I want to go to heaven, I have to give up everything that I've got? Then I'm in trouble. But what we see again is the key area is what Jesus says at the end. He says, sell everything you've got and come and follow me. Don't don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in your own abilities, but come and follow me. And we're told the man went away incredibly sad and the disciples are on the sidelines just shocked. They, they can't keep their mouths shut. They go to Jesus and like, are this guy, Jesus, this guy can't get in? Who, who, who can be saved? What, what, are you, what are you doing? And it's important to understand the context. Remember, first of all, this guy had been following all the rules, all the commandments, everything to the letter of the line. And you notice what Jesus doesn't do? He doesn't say, oh yeah, oh yeah, Really? Really? You followed them all since you're a little boy? I know what little boys are like. There's no way you follow them, right? Notice Jesus doesn't call them out on that because there's a greater truth at work. The other side is this guy was rich, and and according to Jewish tradition, it was believed that if you were rich, if you were wealthy, this was seen as a blessing from God. And so if you had a lot of stuff, this was actually the, the material reality of God blessing you. And now Jesus is saying, actually, you know what? Get rid of all that stuff. I am not worried about your stuff. I'm not not even worried about all the good things that you you supposedly think you're pulling off on me. But, But really, I know. I know. Jesus hits at something far greater. He says, yeah, absolutely. If you think you can get into heaven based on being good, based on living a good life, then it's not going to cut it. And the disciples are disappointed. They're like, oh, this this is not good. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You see, because what is impossible with men and women, what's impossible with you, is possible because of me. It's possible because of God. You see, there, there seems to be an understanding that, that, that is just bubbling within our culture of this idea, well, I just have to live a good life. But for me, that is fraught with problems. That, that will keep me up at night because I know I'm better than some folks, but I also know that there's a long list of people above me as well who, who live a better life than me. And then I start thinking, well, well how, not only how good is good enough, but like how long do I have to be good? Like wh- where, where, where is it? You know, again, a bad place to get your theology is from cartoons, right? The, 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 the thought of like you have like a, a, a good angel and a bad angel on your shoulder, right? You've all seen 
Um, Tom and Jerry, right? Often see that, yeah. You can admit you watch cartoons. There's nothing wrong with cartoons. Just don't get your theology from cartoons, right? And we think that there's this, like, reality of, like, there's one angel who's, who's keeping a record, and there's another angel who's keeping the record of all the bad things, and then is, is, is that what it's going to be like? And then suddenly it's just kind of laid before you when you die of, of one guy brings out his duotang, and the other angel brings out their duotang, and they, like, cross-reference notes. And I'm thinking... Where is the hope in that? Where, where is the assurance in that? And so, and so what we see being done beautifully by Jesus is this reality of then saying, listen, you have to forget about just living a good life because being good enough is not going to be good enough. And you see this time and time again. Who are the one group of people that Jesus actually went after the most in his day? The, the, the religious folks, the, the, the Pharisees, the people who tithe everything. You know, like if they got like 10 Tic Tacs, they would give one back to the temple, right? Like everything. They prayed these incredible prayers. They fasted. They, they did everything right. They knew the scriptures. And Jesus is like, you guys have no idea. And, and they went after Jesus all the time. Why? Because he was hanging out with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners, and, and they came after Jesus and are like, why are you doing this? And he says, well, it's, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but, but the sick. And Jesus is like, if, if you don't see your need for me, then that's the first area. That's the first problem. Which is why, isn't a bit of an aside, we, we never use hell as a threat to get people into a relationship with Jesus. That, that is abusive, that is dysfunctional. I mean, Jesus never did it. Um, um, the, 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 the disciples never did it. And so we don't just kind of like lob this in. Peter says, be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have. The reason for the hope that you have. And the hope is found in the fact that I will never be good enough but thank you, Jesus, that you have been the one who has provided the way for me. Christianity is unique. Christianity is also exclusive. It's unique in the fact that it's not about do this, do that. You look to the cross and say, it's been done. It's been done. And so instead of, of living your life wondering and worrying, have I passed the eternal test? It's like Jesus shows up and says, I've already taken care of it for you. And so suddenly, life is lived not to get God in our favor, but as a response of gratitude and thanksgiving for what Jesus has done for us. It may look very similar, but the heart and the attitude is incredibly different. If you're being good as a means of trying to, to simply get God on your side, that's nerve-wracking. But if you're living life as a response of what Jesus has done, then that's a place of thanksgiving and of gratitude. That's why Jesus' final words to his, or not his final words, but his words to his disciples is, is remember, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Now that can raise challenges in some places, but it can also be seen as the greatest hope that we could possibly be given. Whereas I believe every other faith, every other belief system points to the way of how you have to be, how you have to live. Jesus constantly points to himself as being the way. The early church got a hold of this in Acts 4 when Peter is speaking very early on in his ministry. He says, salvation is found in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. I think the most convincing argument is Jesus in the garden as he's having that intimate conversation with his father 
and he's pouring his heart out because he understands what is about to go down and he says, if there is any other way. And Jesus went to the cross. It makes Christianity unique. It makes Christianity just, just, just in my mind so beautiful because of the reality of knowing that God has come so that no one may perish when we put our faith in him. I'm sure for a lot of us, this may open more questions, may ask, well, but what about this? But, but, but what about that? And, and so let, let, let's keep the conversation going. You know, feel free to be in touch with me throughout the week, phone, email, show up. It's just great to continue to have these conversations. But I think the place we need to go at, regardless of what you believe here this morning, is first of all, what is your source? Where do you go as a sense of authority and truth in your life? And secondly, how does it play out in your life? Because we can talk all about this, but it's not a, a philosophical discussion to simply be had. The heart of God is that all will come to know and love him. And, and he has provided the way in Jesus. And so how we begin living our life today, it's like a ripple effect as it begins to extend into all of eternity. Because eternity, I believe, is life lived with God. Focusing on him and less on ourselves. And so every day we begin to take those steps in that direction. Our heart is being molded more and more into what God desires from us. The wonderful thing is that when we pray the prayer in the Lord's Prayer, Lord, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not just some fancy statement we make. It can become true today as we begin to experience the presence of God in this moment at this time and we can be filled with such great assurance and hope that we don't have to wonder what happens we don't have to wonder where we'll end up we know that in the love and grace of God through our faith in Jesus we can be with him for all of eternity. Please stand as we sing together.